So our next speaker is uh, David Quammen. David is an extraordinarily gifted author and essayist who has been a preeminent voice for communicating the importance of conservation of nature in the wild and the complexities of the interactions between the natural world and humans. He initially studied literature as an undergraduate English major at, at Yale with Robert Penn Warren uh, and continued studies on, on Faulkner. He studied Faulkner at Yale and then went on to study as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. He eventually turned his writing to nonfiction, and I think it's our uh, gain that he did so. Uh, he started with a column called Natural Acts for Outside Magazine, which he did for 15 years. Uh, and he, there, with that began the challenging work of how do you communicate on nature and science with the public. His books have included The Song of the Dodo, Monster of God, Wild Thoughts from Wild Places, which was my first read of uh, David Quammen's work. Um, and then he joined after uh, Natural Acts. He went and started working with National Geographic, which he has for many years. All of his works are, in fact, a joy to read. Uh, they just pour like butter when you're reading through uh, the language that he uses. He's been recognized with the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Lannan Literary Award for Nonfiction. His uh, 2012 book, Spillover, which you've already seen a cover of, but I brought my visual aid here. Uh, Spillover is a fabulous book. I've given it to a large number of people who have read it, and com including our community liaison committee. Uh, who uh, helps us interface with the, with the public. I think it's, it's a fabulous, fabulous read, David. Um, that book is about the jump, as you've heard, of microorganisms to humans and in in something called zoonosis with the consequences that they cause the emerging infectious diseases. It received the Science and Society Book Award from the National Association of Science Writers and the UK Society of Biology Award in, in general biology. His latest contribution, which sold out almost immediately, but I managed to get a couple of copies of it uh, earlier this week. My wife stole one of them from me immediately, and I've not seen it since. Uh, but it's Yellowstone, A Journey Through America's Wild Heart. It's an absolutely luscious book. Uh, we're really pleased to have you here, David. The title of his talk is Scary Viruses in a Globalized World, World Telling the Story. David. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, thank you all. It's great to be here. I'm honored to be part of this, uh, this event this afternoon. Yeah. There we go. Go to my stuff. OK. All right. um, when, um, are we coming up? There we go. There's my guy. Um, when I was contacted by uh, Jerry Cush and Paul Dupre about being part of this, um, this gathering this weekend, uh, my first reaction was, what in the world, what, a gathering of 400 uh, of the world's best infectious disease scientists? What in the world could I say to them? Those people are my sources. They're my inspiration. What could I say to them? And Jerry Cush says, well, you can, uh, you can talk about how to tell the story. So that's why I'm here to say a little bit about how to tell this story. Um, I know that we have a, uh, a mixed audience, sort of a mosaic audience, of uh, infectious disease scientists and of the general public. And I'm going to try and take that into account. But first, I want to add a couple more thank yous to the thank yous that, that Ron has already given. First of all, Ron himself. Uh, Ron Corley, I'm very grateful, and to President uh, Brown, and I mentioned Paul Dupre and Jerry Cush, also Dr. Shirley Klein and, uh, and Claire Gimble, um, and all of you for including me in this, in this mosaic gathering this afternoon with members of the general public as well as infectious disease scientists. So what I'm going to do is what I was asked to do, um, talk a bit about how to tell the story I am, uh, and for the, uh, for the infectious disease scientists, I apologize when I'm telling you things that you already well know. And for the general public, I apologize when I'm telling you things that might seem a little obscure or, or, or not aimed toward you. But I'm going to try and be inclusive and move back and forth between talking about telling the story and showing you how I tell the story 
when I have a chance. Um, I'll talk uh, mainly about um, viruses. Uh, if, um, if I were giving a longer version of this, I would, I would go into the whole uh, set of categories of different kinds of creature uh, capable of causing infectious disease in humans, you know, bacteria and, and worms and prions and um, fungi and what did I leave out? Protists. Um, but, um, but viruses are the most dramatic the most urgent viruses are the charismatic microfauna, and so today I'm going to stick with viruses. Um, I'm going to proceed in a very simple way. I'm going to talk about three principles of communicating this area of science to the general public. I'm going to offer five suggestions about how that might be well done, and then I'm going to define six words. And uh, and then try and conclude with whatever that might have to do with the history of the world. Um, first of all, my three principles. Everything comes from somewhere. This is a truism that happens to have truth and content. And it's worth reminding people, as, as Tony Fauci has been doing just now, these diseases come from particular places. Um, there is history and geography involved in the outbreak of all of these new diseases. They have a starting point in space and in time. And maybe it's a little village in southeastern Guinea, like this one, a little village called Meliandu, where, as far as we can tell, the 2014 Ebola outbreak slash epidemic began in late 2013. Like other outbreaks and epidemics, it had a start, it had a place, and then it traveled. Viruses aren't preternatural, they're just viruses. And this is something that is actually worth remembering because viruses are very spooky to the general public. Viruses like Ebola, new viruses like Zika, uh, and yet, and yet they are just agents. They're not even exactly living things. Um, they have limits. They have limits in the way they are transmitted. They, each virus has its own ecology. It has its own evolution. Um, there are limits in how long they can survive outside of living cells. There are limits in where they can go and what they can do. Um, uh, and, and it's worth remembering that. Now, some of them are very potent, very dangerous, particularly spooky. The worst, this is famous Fred Murphy photomicrograph of Ebola. Maybe the first, if I understand correctly, the first photograph of the Ebola virus ever taken. Uh, the worst of them are very ferocious, and yet they're just viruses. Uh, and we're smarter than they are. This year's menace is not the last, of course. And again, you've been hearing of this from Tony Fauci and others. These things have been happening over time. He showed you uh, a chart and a number of maps. And uh, I've got my own maps, and we'll, we'll see some of this. But, um, but this year, it's Zika. Two years ago, it was Ebola. Next year or the year after, it'll be something else. And maybe it'll be a re-emerging disease that makes itself dire and serious and urgent again, or maybe it'll be something entirely new. But it's important to remember that these things are not independent events. They're part of a larger pattern. They are going to keep happening to us because of things that we do. Um, now, public health and people and infectious disease scientists um, know that very well, but the general public uh, needs to be reminded about that, that prediction and prevention uh, are just as crucial as emergency res response and probably more useful in the long run. So, so it's worth looking at the big picture. It's worth looking at the global uh, picture. Um, and one way of doing that that I like to use is just running people through the drumbeat of 
newly recognized, newly emerged diseases just over the last 50 or 60 years. So I track that back to Machupo, a virus that emerged in Bolivia, 1961, a wonderful um, heroic infectious disease scientist uh, who has become a friend of mine named Carl Johnson was there with some colleagues working on Machupo in Bolivia, 1961. And then 1967, Marburg virus coming out of Central, coming out of East Africa, Uganda, getting to Marburg, Ger Germany, starting to make people sick and kill them and being recognized for what it was, a particular kind of virus, a filovirus. And then Ebola, first recognized in 1976, both in Zaire and in Sudan, almost simultaneously. Uh, HIV, recognized in the US, 1981. A much older disease, much older we know now, but first detected. Um, at that point, 1981, in New York and California. Hantavirus. Uh, some of you may remember the great Hantavirus scare of 1993 when people started dying in the Four Corners area of the American Southwest. Again, an older disease, but hitting the Americas and hitting the radar screens in 1993. Hendra virus, a very interesting virus in Australia, first detected in 1994. Uh, affecting racehorses, killing them, and then making sick the people, the, the trainers and the veterinarians who took care of racehorses. Bird flu in the form of H5N1, um, first um, coming out of uh, Hong Kong in 1997. Nipah virus, Malaysia, 1998. Each of these has a strange, uh, amazing telling story. Um, West Nile, hitting New York in 1999, as Tony said. Uh, SARS coming out of southern China, 2003. More recently, MERS out of the Arabian Peninsula in 2012. Again, all of these are viruses. Um, all of them are, are scary pathogens. And now, most recently, Zika virus, this year's version. Um, so there's this drumbeat. That's what's been happening over just recent decades. All right, so how to talk about this, how to think about this, how to communicate some of these things to the general public. Um, since I've been asked, I will, I'm not, um, I'm not a writing teacher, I, I'm not in the business of teaching communication, but I will humbly offer out of my list, my facetious list of 23 hard-won, simple-minded tips on how to communicate science to the general public, uh, I selected five to talk about here. Um, First of all, people want to read about people. They want to hear about people. They want human stories. Even if you're talking about scary viruses, you need to remember that people are the story. Who is that little girl? Who is that little girl living in the middle of a bushmeat economy where viruses are passing every which way? Who is that poor man being restrained as he, as he in his delirium, he tried to escape from an Ebola treatment unit in Sierra Leone and was photographed by my uh, wonderful photographer, Pete Muller, my colleague on a National Geographic assignment. Uh, people want to hear the stories of humans. So if you're telling stories of humans, it means there's narrative. There's a beginning and a middle and an end. There is a plot. There is a story. And a mystery story is even better. Everyone loves a mystery. Now, this lends itself well to communicating about emerging infectious diseases because every new emerging infectious disease is a mystery waiting to be solved. And it's the disease scientists, particularly the field people, well, not particularly, the lab people, hugely important too. But these are the people who go out and attempt to solve the mystery. Uh, what is this new disease? What causes it? Oh, here's a virus. It's a new virus. We've never seen it before. What kind of virus? What family of viruses does it belong in? What shall we call it? Um, uh, please don't name it after our city. Please don't name it after our country. Uh, so the scientists are out there, including John Epstein of EcoHealth Alliance, here pictured with a, with a giant fruit bat in, where were we, Bangladesh, um, working on research on Nipah virus. These people, the disease scientists, are the Philip Marlowe's, the Sam Spades, the Sherlock Holmeses. 
who go out to solve the mysteries, and they make for great characters in fascinating stories. So if you're Sherlock Holmes, when Dr. Watson calls, let him in. And what I mean by that is you all, you disease scientists, are, I'm sure, constantly contacted by journalists, people in my profession, um, who want your words, your thoughts, your wisdom, who want to talk to you, who want to ask you questions, who want to write about your work, either um, in tomorrow morning's newspaper or in a magazine article that comes out six months from now or in a book that may take five, eight years. It is useful and valuable to you and your story to give them access, but you are entitled to be selective. You are entitled to be careful. So don't just feel like you need to talk to every journalist who f emails you or finds your telephone number. Uh, you are entitled to select for responsible, cautious, conscientious work, checking the facts, getting the quotes right, getting the context right. So, so choose, your, choose your Dr. Watson. Choose your Boswell with some care, but let some of us in. Um, and, uh, and John Epstein did. This is me with, with his field crew in, in Bangladesh. Uh, for my side, it's important for the journalist, for the science writer, for the nonfiction writer to be very careful to keep faith with these sources, to keep faith with this trust. Uh, and that brings me to, to point, I don't know why my numbers got weird, one, two, one, two, one, two. Uh, that's, a, that's a ghost in the machine somewhere between PowerPoint for Mac and a PC, I think. Uh, anyway, at least the words are right. Important principle for writing, communicating about science, dial down precision, never compromise on accuracy. Scientists love precision. Science is about precision as well as accuracy. Um, four decimal points of precision or more. You can't deliver that to the general public in a short piece or even a longish piece. The general public does not have the appetite, does not have the time, does not have the attention or the, or the background for all of that scientific precision. And yet, it's absolutely crucial to be accurate. So you dial down precision if you're a science communicator, realizing that you must never compromise on accuracy. Um, and finally, Jargon is not always bad. Uh, I know that people say, well, scientists, you know, they talk in jargon. They communicate with one another in scientific papers in code. What is all that technical language? Well, um, you needn't feel guilty about technical language. Technical language is very useful. It's concise and precise, and sometimes it's just the best way to go. There are words that cannot be improved on, although they're thought of as scientific technical language. They say much more than longer versions could. Words like allele and meiosis. Um, and, and the six words that I'm going to define now. Zoonosis, easy to define. A zoonosis is an animal infection transmissible to humans. Uh, might be a virus, might be one of other, those other things um, that I mentioned. Um, if it, uh, whoops, if it gets into humans, takes hold, causes symptoms, causes trouble, then we call that a zoonotic disease. Uh, and this, zoonotic diseases, this is not um, a fringe subject uh, out on the weird edge of medicine. This is central and its implications are very big. Um, about 60% of the infectious diseases among humans, at least according to this source, uh, which is a good source, but uh, Tony Fauci had a slightly different number. If you have to choose, trust his. Uh, anyway, a lot of them, most infectious diseases in humans are zoonotic. Zoonotic in the strict sense. 
Uh, and that includes some of the most infamous old ones, like bubonic plague, as well as um, most of the scary new ones, like, uh, or re-emerging ones, like hantavirus, Ebola, and Zika. They come originally from animals. Uh, those are in the strict sense. Now, in the broader sense, probably most infectious diseases, maybe you could say all infectious diseases of humans, are originally zoonotic in origin because we are a relatively young species. And as I said earlier, everything comes from somewhere. So these things have, over the years, some things like measles have adapted um, to be uniquely human, uh, but they started somewhere else. Um, reservoir host. Any species in which a zoonotic bug lives inconspicuously, uh, permanently, without causing notable symptoms is known as the reservoir host. That's where the thing lives when it's not causing trouble because it's got to live in some living creature. Uh, another statistic about uh, this percentage, 72% of our um, Zoonotic diseases come directly from wildlife, as opposed to, say, coming from domestic animals who get infected from wildlife. Um, uh, they, they come from all different kinds of wildlife, but in particular, uh, rodents have been implicated in a lot of diseases. I mentioned bubonic plague and, and hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Bats are the reservoir hosts of the Hendra, that Hendra, virus that falls out of bats in Australia and gets into racehorses and then into humans. Um, HIV-1M, the pandemic strain, came to humans from chimpanzees uh, a long time ago, much longer than we tend to think, 100 years or more perhaps. Uh, the influenzas all originate in wild aquatic birds. Um, West Nile also resides in birds, SARS coronavirus in bats, uh, and the reservoir host of Ebola virus is, we don't know, despite what you may have heard. Despite, you may have heard that, oh, Ebola has its reservoir in bats. We don't know that. It hasn't been proved that the final uh, standard of proof has not been met, so we still don't know uh, where Ebola virus hides out. Uh, vector. Um, some scary viruses don't pass directly from the reservoir host into humans. They go through an intermediary. We call that a vector. Um, and that is another sort of creature that's neither reservoir host nor victim, but sort of an, an intermediary. Uh, Vector-borne diseases are this category. Usually the vector is an arthropod, uh, an insect, or maybe a, a tick or a flea. Uh, what's the difference between a reservoir host and a vector? That's actually kind of a complicated subject. People disagree. People interpret it in different ways. But I think the safest thing to say about that, at least as the words are commonly used, is that unlike a reservoir host, a vector comes looking for you, bringing the infection with it. Uh, and reservoir hosts don't do that. And the negative side of that to remember is that with reservoir hosts, if we leave them alone, we'll be fine. It's not true of vectors. Uh, with a vector-borne disease, the geographical distribution of the vector uh, tends to determine where the disease can be expected to occur. Uh, spillover. When a zoonotic bug passes from its reservoir host into its first human victim, that event is called spillover. And that's why spillover is the title of my book. Um, spillover happens because of opportunity. The virus gets an opportunity to pass from its reservoir host into a new kind of victim. Uh, it takes that opportunity. Um, and generally, that happens because people come into contact with wildlife. Uh, they might be eating wildlife. When people do that in Africa, we call it bushmeat. It has a little bit of a negative uh, 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 tone to it. When people do it in Montana, where I live, we call it game. It's the same thing. Uh, different animals, but the same thing. People eating wildlife. It's an excellent way to pick up a zoonotic virus. Or people might just be trapping wild animals uh, and transporting them live to market, getting exposed. They might be keeping wild animals as pets. 
Uh, they might get bitten or scratched by an animal that they encounter in their attic or their garage, or they might just be sweeping up dust in an old shed, and if that dust is seasoned with mouse urine, and the mouse urine contains hantavirus, then people might breathe that and contract uh, hanta. In any case, the virus somehow gets an opportunity to take hold in a human. Um, now, back to Ebola 2014. Uh, again, 28,000 cases, uh, 28,000 cases in the West Africa event. And of those 28,000, there was one spillover, as far as we know. And I think we know this well from genetic evidence. Uh, I don't know if Parda Sabeti is in the um, audience today, but I think she's here at this meeting. We know that there was one spillover that led to 28,000 cases. Um, so, well, given that sort of a ratio, why is the spillover event so important? It's be important because although the 28,000 cases are human-to-human -human transmission and there's a one, only one spillover, if you prevent the spillover, the rest of those cases don't happen. Uh, so, uh, once spillover does happen, virus gets into a human, uh, evolution comes into play. If this particular virus is highly adaptable, uh, if it mutates rapidly, if it changes quickly, uh, if it adapts well to new circumstances, then it's all the more likely to succeed as a zoonotic infection. Natural selection occurs. This is basic Darwinism. The fittest variants of the virus survive and get passed along. And so an animal virus becomes, or is capable of becoming, a human virus. Great vistas of possibility open to the virus. And I'm going to finish with those vistas of possibility. Um, if it's that adaptable, it travels. Where does it travel? It travels the world. It travels amid a population of 7 billion people, 7 billion new hosts. Once it has adapted to humans, it has won the sweepstakes in terms of its host population, its potential host population. And those 7 billion people in a globalized world are all pretty closely interconnected. Um, so final word, outbreak. I've been using it, we've all been using it in the ecological or in the, uh, in the epidemiological sense, an outbreak. A spillover happens and you have an outbreak of disease. The other definition of it is, comes from the world of ecology. A population outbreak of any particular creature is a huge sudden increase in abundance of some particular creature. Particularly occurs among forest insects, forest uh, uh, infecting lepidoptera, moths in particular, tent caterpillars, which are a kind of moth, gypsy moths, other kinds of moths, spruce budworm, infecting whole forests because their population suddenly explodes in this population outbreak. Now, um, some people have pointed out that we humans ourselves, seven billion of us now on this planet, are a population outbreak too in the ecological sense. That's controversial, but there are ecologists, including forest entomology ecologists, who say we humans are a population outbreak. We fit, we fit the pattern. Um, one piece of support for that is we know from the fossil record there has never been a large-bodied species of animal on this planet as abundant as we are now. So we're a population outbreak. What happens with population outbreaks? Well, they end. And frequently, they end suddenly. They end with a crash. Um, why do they end with a crash? Is it because uh, they have eaten up all their resources? Uh, we've all read Jared Diamond. We've all read Guns, Germs, and Steel. And we're inclined to think that that's what happens. Collapse, also, that book. Uh, you outrun your resources and your population, your civilization ends. But in fact, the, the entomologists tell us that's not what happens with these insect outbreaks. What happens to cause them to crash are viral infections, viral pandemics throughout the population. 
Uh, those, those tent caterpillars get all crowded together and they, they increase hugely in abundance. This virus is there, a particular group of viruses called the nucleopolyhedrosis viruses, the NPVs. That won't be on the quiz at the end of the lecture. Um, and they cause the populations of these insects to crash. So turn the crank on that thought, as I do uh, at more length in, in my book on this, and you come to the dark idea that some people have voiced that we humans, as a population outbreak, are perhaps destined to crash, too, from infectious disease, perhaps from one terrible pandemic. And there are even dark-hearted souls out there who, who say, well, this, this would be a cure for all the negative things that human uh, overabundance, human population on this planet, um, is causing, that we are headed toward a, a disease-caused, perhaps a virus-caused crash that will end our population outbreak, knock us way down to the level of a few tent caterpillars in the forest, and, uh, and uh, um, give Earth a chance to recover. Well, I'm not one of those dark-hearted souls. I don't like that thought at all. And I've talked to um, the scientists, including the forest entomologists uh, about this, and there is one important thing to remember um, that uh, I hope relieves us of that prospect, um, and it is what I said at the beginning. We are smarter than viruses. We have infectious disease scientists. We have people doing research in BSL-4 labs. We have needle. We have the expertise that is sampled in this room. We are smarter than viruses, and uh, we're even smarter than tent caterpillars. And that's the good news. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. <laughs>